Welcome to Dominican University of California. My name is Denise Lucy, and it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you here tonight. This is the sixth annual One Book, One Marin Award. And Dominican is just so proud to have been invited by Marin County Libraries to participate in this program for the last six years. Um, the program offers our Dominican students wonderful opportunity to, to engage with the community, and we're just thrilled that you're here with us. Uh, I wanted to just make a couple of comments before I introduce Gail Haar, the director of Marin County Free Library, and that is that this is the last of 13 events we've held this academic year for the Leadership Lecture Series, and private Ocean Wealth Management has been our sponsor, and we're just so thrilled that they could help us. Can you thank them, please? And I also have some graduates who have, who have spent four years in this auditorium greeting you, I hope with welcome arms, and they are graduating and leaving us. And I'm really sorry about that. I'm happy but I'm, I'm, I'm sorry they're leaving. So would you please thank them for all their service. So it is my honor to introduce to you Gail Haar, Director of Marin County Free Library. So a wise old man once told me you should always start your remarks with a joke. What building in Marin has the most stories? The library. And also bookstores and universities. Um, whenever I tell somebody I'm a librarian, and sometimes, not recently, but they used to tell me that joke, and I would just groan inwardly. Um, but as I start to think about what we bring to our community, what libraries bring to the community through One Book, One Marin, there's really a lot of truth in that old joke, because through One Book, One Marin, we, keep our, we bring our communities together to share their stories, um, stimulated by a common book and um, inspired by all the programming that we do around it. So tonight we're here to mark the sixth anniversary of One Book, One Marin and to honor Michael Lucas and his novel, The Oracle of Stambul. And programs around the county have had hundreds of people coming to enjoy Turkish food and listen to Turkish music and talk about the book. And as these people met and talked, they formed communities. Maybe they were temporary communities, but they were still communities that they shared their stories. And none of this could have happened without the generosity of all these people on the slide behind me. Um, they're individuals and businesses and corporations that know how important literacy and reading is to a community um, and demonstrate that um, understanding by supporting One Book, One Marin. And so on behalf of Book Passage and Dominican University and the Alamany Library and all of the public libraries in Marin County, and I'm going to read them out because there's a lot of them, um, San Anselmo, San Rafael, Sausalito, Mill Valley, Belvedere, Tiburon, Larkspur, and all 10 branches of the Marin County Free Library, I would like to thank all the sponsors for their support. Um, in fact, I think we should give them a hand because they deserve it. And I think some of them are here with us tonight. And I just want to tell my personal story, and it's that I was lucky enough to get to go to Turkey um, several years ago and to spend some time traveling. And the beautiful language from the Oracle of Istanbul just brought it right back. You know, historic Istanbul really hasn't changed that much since the time of the Ottoman Empire. And you have these wonderful smells on the street, and they're, it's bustling, and it's exotic. Um, and I really wanted to thank Mac Michael for sharing his story with me and with all of us in Marin. And with that, I would like to introduce someone who really doesn't need much introduction, Elaine Petricelli, who is the president of Book Passage and a collector of stories extraordinaire. And this is the most fun. I just love this one book, one Marin. And um, I, I just want to say to you that the committee, when we met to decide on this book, it was the most exciting meeting because there was so much depth and richness in the Oracle of Istanbul, and we could think of so many things we needed to talk about. Uh, as you know, this is our sixth year. 
The prior winners of the One Book, One Marin Award are Isabel Allende, Amy Tan, Dave Eggers, Michael Shaben, and Abraham Verghese. To have chosen a new author is quite amazing. <laughs> Dr. Michael Krasny, who all of you know from Forum, and by the way, tomorrow on Forum, he's going to be interviewing Michael David Lucas, uh, <laughs> has been a supporter of One Book, One Marin from the very first day. He has given us of his time, and uh, we are so grateful to him. A lot of you know Dr. Krasny. You know that he is a beloved English professor at San Francisco State University. Uh, some of you know that he started his radio career in Marin County with a program called Beyond the Hot Tub. I remember that. Uh, his, his, be, beyond Forum, he is in great demand nationally as an interviewer on both radio and television and it, before audiences. His two books, for those of us who are not uh, reading textbooks, uh, are uh, Off Mic, a memoir of talk, radio, and a literary life. And let me tell you, if you want to know what those people he interviews, those Tony Morrisons, those Jimmy Carters, those Salman Rushdie say when the mic's not on, read that book. Uh, his latest book, Spiritual Envy, An Agnostic's Quest, will give you lots to wonder about, lots to think about, and lots to laugh about, too. So we're very thrilled that Dr. Krasny will be in conversation with Michael tonight. Michael David Lucas uh, knows Turkey well. He was a Fulbright scholar in Turkey. He's also worked as a night proofreader in Tel Aviv. He um, was a waiter at the Bread Loaf uh, Literary uh, Retreat. Maybe that's where he uh, overheard some things he needed. Um, he has won numerous awards. He is a fabulous teacher. He teaches third and fourth grades and, uh, and adults. He taught last year at the Book Passage Travel Writers Conference about writing with a sense of place. And boy, does the Oracle of Stambul have a lyric sense of place. So it is my honor and pleasure to introduce these two amazing Michaels to you tonight. Welcome, and um, glad to be here with you. I guess a good place to begin is when Elaine mentions all of the um, rather um, extraordinary people who have been here, and I've done all of these now, I guess, uh, starting out with Isabel Allende and then Amy Tan. You're in some pretty rarefied uh, company there for a first novel. Um, how's it feel? It feels great. It feels great. <laughs> <laughs> it's been one book, I mean, the whole getting published and sort of having this dream and, you know, quitting my job and sort of believing in myself has been amazing, but the one book, one Marin has sort of been the pinnacle so far, and I feel like this is the peak of that experience. Um, yeah, it's just been so great, Elaine and Karen and Gail and everyone at Dominican and all the librarians. It's, yeah, it's a wonderful experience. Well, let's, let's talk about how this experience began for you. It took seven years to write this novel. Yeah. And... Uh, if you can, talk about the genesis of it. Did it begin, well, how did it begin? Where did it begin? Um, it began after I was, after college, I, I spent a year in Tunisia. And um, I was working on my MFA in creative writing applications. And when I finished them, I sort of had this moment where it was the first time where I considered myself a writer and didn't have a project to work on. And so I just sort of sat with that absence for a while, and then after a while I got a little sort of anxious. And um, there was one afternoon that I went for a run, and I had this image of a, of a little girl playing back in with two older men. And then that was it. You know, I, I knew that she was the protagonist of my novel, but I had no idea who she was or where she lived or when she lived or what her relationship with these older men was. 
Um, and so I just, you know, I, I sort of trusted in, in that, uh, that feeling that I knew she was the protagonist um, and tried to figure out, you know, I spent the next couple months sort of trying to place her in time and, and in place. And um, How did that happen, I mean, in it, terms of placing her? Well, it, it didn't happen for a while. And, and she was bouncing all over the place. She was in Cairo. She was in Damascus. She was in <laughs> the 13th century. She was in the 19th century. And after a while, I was just like, enough. You know, I can't start this book unless I know where she lives and when she lives. And so some people might be able to start their books before they know that, but not me. And so I kind of packed her at the bottom of my bag, and I spent the rest of my time in Tunisia. And the other thing that was happening in my life at that time is I was sort of breaking up with my college girlfriend, and um, in part because she was doing the Peace Corps in Uzbekistan. And... So I decided I was going to go visit her after Tunisia. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to sort of give it a last shot, or, or at least see her as it sort of deteriorated. And so I, <laughs> it's important, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, so I, I bought it. She was being supplanted by Eleonora, too, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I bought a ticket to Uzbekistan. And, and for whatever reason, there's no Uzbek embassy in Tunis. So I had to go to Istanbul to get my visa. Um, and I had the address, I had my lonely plan, I had everything, um, but I could not find the embassy. I, I spent four days, the entirety of my time, I, was, I figured four days would be enough, but it wasn't. And I was just wandering around the city looking for this embassy, and, and finally I figured, okay, I have like a letter of introduction from her, that should be enough. Um, and so I convinced my way onto the plane and um, went to Uzbekistan, and then when I got to Uzbekistan, the guy at the visa office was just like, no, it's not happening. Um, and and that, there's a whole other story in there that's sort of more long and reflects poorly on me, so I won't go into it. But um, I ended up being deported from Uzbekistan and sent back to Istanbul. And... You're the first person I've ever met who's been deported from Uzbekistan. Really? <laughs> You met a lot of people, too. Um, so I ended up, uh, the blessing in there is I ended up with 10 days to myself in, in Istanbul. And I'd been to the city before, and so I'd been to all the tourist sites and everything like that. And so I just kind of did what I love to do when I visit a city, which is just wander around the different neighborhoods. And it was probably the third or fourth day I was in this neighborhood called Chukarjuma, which is the setting of Orhan Pamuk's most recent novel. Mm -hmm. And a Nobel Prize winning Turkish novelist. And a great novel. So my old radio movies. mind says, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. So I went to, uh, this neighborhood's famous for its antique stores. And so I um, went to this one antique store, it's this narrow little sort of junk shop. Um, and really dusty and, you know, filled with stuff. And at the back of it was a, was a crystal punch bowl with a stack of photos in the middle of the punch bowl. And the top of that stack was a picture of a little girl standing on a chair and kind of leaning against a podium. Um, and I knew as soon as I saw her that, you know, this was my protagonist, this was that little girl playing backgammon, and, and that the novel was going to be set in 19th century Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And... So everything sort of clicked, and I went back to my hotel and spent the night feverishly writing. Um, and I should say it's the only night I've ever spent feverishly writing. <laughs> Didn't you feel you had to learn all about the setting once you had decided on it and do research about the Ottoman Empire and all that? I, I definitely did, and later I did that. But I think that what was missing for me was really just sort of a, a sense of um, place in history. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that I wanted her to be living in sort of a, 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 a powerful political center at, um, at a moment of sort of flux. But I didn't know what it was going to be. And once I sort of figured out what her place was, then, yeah, then it then I sort of came. But her birth is almost like a kind of nativity. I mean, it's uh, miraculous in many ways. It suggests, of course, what you move into in the oracular sense of her uh, as a protagonist. What led to that? I mean, the idea that somebody could actually be born in a way that would maybe uh, be prescient for the future and turn the world on its axis, even? Well, I think that um, 
So the other thing that was going on for me in Tunisia, if I want to like sort of psychologize myself, um, is that I, I, I had a Rotary Foundation scholarship, and my my mission there was to sort of repair the gap of understanding between the United States and the Arab world. <laughs> and I did it. Yeah, <laughs> you guys didn't hear. So um, I'm not going to quiz you, but <laughs> I, I know you do speak Arabic. I do. And uh, this was a mission accomplished, you say? Yeah, it was mission accomplished. You, you didn't worry about that? Um, so it was, it was sort of this overwhelm. I mean, it was right after September 11th, so it was 2003. So it was right after September 11th, and it was right after, just a couple of months after the United States um, invaded Iraq. And so it was not really a good time to be repairing that chasm of understanding. Um, and I think I felt really frustrated. I know I felt really frustrated. Um, and so I sort of delved into these books that I brought with me, and, and luckily a lot of the books sort of answered the questions that I was having, or at least presented a world that sort of made me feel better about these questions. Um, so like The Tin Drum by Gunter Grass, or The Stone Raft by um, Jose Saramago, um, and the, the History of the Siege of Lisbon also by Jose Saramago. They're all stories in which one person sort of pushes back against the tides of history and, and changes the course of history. Um, and so I was really attracted to that idea. Chris, I, I was mentioning uh, to you that I just came from teaching a class on what we call, for lack of a better description, magical realism. And there is that sense in your work as well. I'm reminded of Marquez as mm -hmm. well as Quinter Grass. And also reminded of, and I'm sure probably many of your readers might even agree with this, of fairy tales. I mean, mm -hmm. the stepmother and, you know, so much of the book has that sense of being like a fairy tale. I mean, you're yeah. kind of drawing from a lot of sources here in terms of the influence. Huh? Yeah, and I want to say my stepmother's in the audience, and I, I, the stepmother in the book is entirely made up. <laughs> she was a wonderful stepmother. Thank you, Wendy. Um, <laughs> I just had to say that once and for all. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, I, I really consciously started thinking about fairy tales around the third draft. And I, I sort of realized that, that that's where I was going with the book and that was going to inform the book. Um, and so I went back and I read all these fairy tales. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, the, the logic of fairy tales is so much a part of the way we think about stories. And yet to read them, it, they're, they're very bizarre stories. You know, the, the, the logic of what happens, you know, and who gets killed and who is good and who is bad is, is very strange. And Especially strange. the grim fairy tales, which are pretty grim. Really grim, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, if you especially don't read them uh, or read them in the original. There's, there's a book which you may know by Bruno Bettelheim called The Uses of Enchantment, where he says fairy tales take us into mm -hmm. a kind of dark place and then... At the end, you know, Hansel and Gretel come out of the, the forest. And were you trying to follow a similar trajectory? Or? You know, I was trying to follow that at the beginning. Um, and then I, I think that the way I see the book is she sort of moves through literary history as the, as the book progresses in a way. Like she starts out in a fairy tale and then she ends up in kind of like a 19th century building woman or something like that, like a, a, a coming of age story. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely was, was very conscious of that when I was writing it. You said before that you had to come into a kind of confident sense in order to write this book or feel a sense of confidence. Describe more what that means to you or what kind of confidence you're talking about. Um, finding well, a voice? There was definitely finding a voice, but I think before finding a voice, there was learning how to write a novel. And no one, you know, no one tells you when you write a novel, you have to like sort of learn that craft, that it's not something that everyone sort of knows inherently. Um, and I'm a big believer of creative writing programs and creative writing teachers, but I also think that there's really nothing, it, it, there's a point at which, you know, the teacher can, can't take you any further, where you have to go yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sort of got to that point and, and was still sort of learning how the the, a novel works and how, um, you know, what the shape of it is and, and how the voice influences um, 
the characters and the story and all these things. Um, and so it took about three years of writing the novel before I really sort of came to that understanding. At the, at the risk of sounding like the English professor I am, there's, yeah. a, <laughs> there, there's a long standing debate. It started out between H.G. Wells and Henry James about the form of a novel. And uh, Wells said it, it can be saturated. You can put anything you want in it. Mm -hmm. And James said, no, it has to be selective. You have mm -hmm. to make sure that everything's there for a reason. You were working kind of more with a saturation, weren't you? I was working with a saturation and then I would, with each draft I would kind of throw out the previous draft. And so I would saturate and then I would, you know, erase. And then I would saturate again and erase. And so there's, after doing that seven times, there's something selective about that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> because certain things are sort of um, coming to the forefront, whether it's because I'm consciously doing it or not. Your language is, you know, pretty exceptional. I mean, lyrical and, and in many instances quite arresting and compelling. Um, talk about where you have this sense of, uh, well, the lexicon you have and where you were drawn to language and in what ways uh, it's become useful to you. Well, I, I started out writing wanting to be a poet um, when I was 18. And I feel like poetry, it's a wonderful genre, but it's also a very sort of adolescent genre in a way. And I mean that in the best way, because it's, it's so full of feeling. You know, it's all about being sort of awake to the world and, and feeling everything very strongly. Um, and so when I was that age, I wanted to, to be a poet. And, um, Which is how many novelists begin, by the way. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I, I thought it was just me, and then I, I, I've talked to people, and they said that they were the same way. Um, and I took poetry classes, and so I sort of became um, very conscious of language and, and how it works, and, and in a way that I have sort of am not on the day to day when I'm writing prose. But I think it's somewhere sort of deep in there. Um, and then I kept getting rejected from my, the advanced poetry classes at, at college and ended up sort of taking a chance on prose, and mm -hmm. it's worked out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You said you believe in creative writing, and uh, I don't know how many people in the audience know this, but you teach creative writing to what, third and fourth graders? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a kind of magical quality, isn't there, in working with kids at that age? They're amazing. They, you know, I think it's, but I used to say that it's their imagination that, that sort of amazes me, but it's really actually their lack of sort of an internal editor. Because I think we all have wonderful imaginations, but we also have highly refined internal editors. Um, and third and fourth graders just don't. Um, or they're sort of developing that. Um, and you know, it makes it hard to teach them. I was teaching last week, and this one kid just was barking uncontrollably and couldn't stop barking, and I had to send him out of the room. And so sometimes having a lack of an internal editor is not good. Um, but I think with creative writing, the same kid um, is writing a novel from the perspective of a chicken um, who's, <laughs> it gets better. He's going to be um, a teriyaki chicken at a sushi <laughs> restaurant in Oakland. And so he's born in Japan, which is where all good teriyaki chicken comes from. And he gets on the plane, for some reason he's still alive, and goes to Oakland um, and, and throughout the story, he's, his name is soon to be Teriyaki Chicken. And I just think that's so wonderful. So, yeah, there's... You give him the name of your agent? Yeah. No, I, I just stole the idea. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you grew up in Oakland. Yeah, I grew up in Berkeley. Oh, in Berkeley. And, I mean, as a local boy growing up in Berkeley, how was your literary sensibility shaped? That's a good question. I feel like... You know, it wasn't particularly regional. Um, I think I just read whatever was on the shelves at, at my parents' houses um, and, and didn't really have a sense of... I remember um, when I was sort of started, I, I was the editor of the high school paper and I remember sort of this having like an evolving sort of literary sensibility. And I think right around that time, Allen Ginsberg died and I remember on my walk to school... It was 1997. Yeah, that was I my remember, senior year. You did a show on it, yeah. Um, and there was a little cottage um, on my walk to school, and out in front of a cottage was one of Allen Ginsberg's poems, and it was written about that cottage that was on my walk to school. 
because um, I guess he lived in Berkeley for, for a few years. And so that was sort of the beginning of my sense that the Bay Area is this wonderful literary place. Um, but it came very late in life. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the process of writing this novel. Um, you had to immerse yourself into a lot of research. You've already indicated that. But you also had to let your imagination kind of go free, too, to a great degree, didn't you? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I think that there's this tension um, in writing historical novels, and particularly ones that are not sort of tied to actual history, um, between the research and the imagination. And I think that, you know, we've all read those historical novels that are um, over-researched, and, and the writer is just kind of putting in, you know, things to prove that they did the research, that they found some little, you know, interesting person who lived in that time period. Um, and so, obviously, it's important to do it, because you don't want to, you know, say that there's a Louis the Fourteenth chair when it should be a Louis the Sixteenth chair, because, as I've learned, people will send you emails about that and tell you that you're wrong. Um, and you want to be accurate to a certain extent. Um, so yeah, I, I, I studied Hebrew and Arabic literature and sort of the Middle East in college and um, read everything I could find about the Ottoman Empire and then lived in Turkey. But then at a certain point, I think, I think I just had to sort of set all that aside and say, okay, here's the world as it existed in history that I know X amount of things about. Um, but it, then I, the story, though. Then what's my world that I'm creating sort of alongside or on top of that world? But, I mean, does the story begin to take over, the need to tell the story? Because you, have so, you actually have a lot of stories interwoven here. I mean, mm -hmm. you have her story, this prodigy, wonderful child, and you also have all the political intrigue later on, and her father, and stowaway, and all of that is moving you towards something eventually. I mean, yeah. it has to have all the threads the figure in the carpet, to use the Henry James statement, which is appropriate for this book. Yeah. They all have to come together, right? Yeah, I think, and I think the story really should take over, you know, if it's history. And so I think you have a responsibility to at least sort of hint at the fact. I think that, I think that the novelist owes a larger debt to the story than to history. Um, and, you know, whenever possible, those things should, you know, coexist in harmony. But when one of them has to win, I would say the story should win out. Um, but I also think that, you know, I think it's a responsibility because a lot of people do read historical fiction as, or hint, hint at places where it sort of deviates from history. What was the historical story that you wanted to tell? I wanted to tell, well, I wanted to have this little girl come into a time and place in history where things could change drastically and things could have gone one of many ways. Um, and I wanted her to just kind of push in one direction um, and in a way to create the world that I want to live in. Um, and, and so that was sort of my very theoretical desire that doesn't really actually even come through in the book that much. But it was sort of what was motivating me um, really deep down inside was, was this, was a desire to create a world that I wanted to live in. Um, it and, sounds very utopian almost, or idealistic at least. Yeah, or, or, or at least I think I wanted to, I was feeling really disempowered and wanted to sort of change history and knew that I couldn't. And so the next best thing was to write a sort of fictional world in which history was changed. An alternative history. Yeah. yeah. But, it, it, you know, there's all these wonderful alt histories, and I think that my, my book sort of stops short of that, and so I wouldn't want to sort of claim that mantle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you lived in Egypt, you lived in Tunisia, you absorbed a lot of those cultures, and mm -hmm. in fact, you're now, you're now working on a book about Egypt. Yeah. Novel, so yeah, about so there's not, somebody had asked if there would be a sequel. I guess that uh, we'll have to wait for that. Uh, Although this kid, this kid, character still with you? Is she still with you? You know, she's not. I wish. <laughs> Sorry to all those people who might want a sequel. I think, you know, I think that she, for me, she, she did her duty. And, you know, when the story was over, she kind of, I don't want to give any spoilers, but she kind of um, disappears in a way. And when, when she disappears, for me, that's it. You know, she might as well have fallen off a cliff. 
And I mean, not in, in the best of ways. Uh, <laughs> you may have to explain that later on to me. <laughs> I think, I, I, I think that, that, you know, people, uh, when the book was published, I, th th what I mean to say is I didn't think about her, what happened next at all. And when the book was published, um, a lot of people would send me emails or come up to me and ask what happened after the end. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was, a, it was a closed unit. The book was sort of done after the end, um, and I was sort of satisfied with what happened. And so, yeah, I, I have no idea. I like to, the, the sort of nicer way to say it is I like to think that um, she exists, that, uh, there's, tens of thousands of different endings in all the people who have read the book's mind. That sounds like Sh Scheherazade or something. Yeah, um, a little bit like that, definitely. Well, you spent seven years with her. I mean, you certainly learned to love her, didn't you? No, I, I, I love her very much and I care a lot about her, but you know, it's, it, it's, like, a, it's like a former relationship. You look back on those times. <laughs> We're back to Uzbekistan. Yeah, back at, exactly, like, like Aviva. Um, you look back on the relationship with fondness, but you know, you're also sort of glad that it's over and you're moved on to the next thing. <laughs> well, what, um, what about all the political intrigue and espionage and everything? What, what drew you into that part of the plotting? You know, I, it's this amazing time for sort of spying in the world. It's like the great game is going on, um, the, the sort of spying between England and Russia, um, and you know the United States is just sort of starting to get involved in espionage. And I wanted to show, you know, it, it, there's all these different sorts of political actors who have different types of political influence, and I thought that that was an important thing to sort of get in there. And I'm really, I'm just interested in general, I, in part because, you know, I lived in Egypt, and I lived in Tunisia, and in Turkey, and, and after a while, people started sort of wondering whether I was a spy and asking me, and um, my, I remember my friend's dad said, you don't have to tell me if you're a spy, just go like this. <laughs> um, and so I think that experience made me start thinking about, yeah, what, what it would mean to be a spy, and sort of how much that influences um, our politics. And you have an American spy. Yeah, he's an American spy right. and, and reverend. Yeah. Um, and where did he come from? He, that, so there's a, um, there's a university in Istanbul called uh, Roberts College. And it was founded as a part of this sort of network of American um, religious universities in the Middle East. And th those universities were in part trying to sort of um, proselytize, and in part they were kind of hotbeds of um, espionage. And I, I just thought, I, it's like American University of Beirut, American University of Cairo, um, Roberts College, there's one in Eastern Turkey whose name I always forget. And I, I went to American University of Cairo when I was studying abroad, and so I was always kind of interested, like, what was it like for these Americans to come over here in 1870? Like, how different was this place, and what was their sort of orientation towards this place? Um, and I, I really wanted to explore that. Um, and then the character as he evolved, I sort of, he's one of the few characters that I kind of crammed a bunch of different characters into, but I, I feel like I should do that more because I love how he turned out. He's, he's sort of this bundle of contradictions, um, which I guess is what happens when you cram characters. This is also what uh, Shambul is, a bundle of contradictions. Yeah. You know. yeah. Um, and yet there's something quite exotic that you're able to communicate. You wanted to capture that, I think, didn't you? I wanted to capture that. I, I also wanted to show you know, the way that it's home to a lot of people. I, I, it was definitely a sort of fine line I was trying to walk between the exoticism. And I, Eleanor, it, it was a l made a little bit easier because Eleanor is not from there. And it's, it's this big, amazing, crazy, exotic place to her. So I was able to sort of impart that. Um, and have a see through her eyes. See it through her eyes. But I also wanted to, you know, impart through the bay and impart through the sultan. 
I wanted, I didn't want to forget that it's also, you know, a lot of people's home. People just grow up there just like they grew up in Oakland. Mm -hmm. How do you think, uh, I mean, the book has been well received and, you know, the, the, the reviews have been really quite uh, uh, complimentary and, and laudatory. How do you see your novel fitting into, say, the schema of the, the world we live in today? It's uh, universality or its relevance? You know, I, I would like to think that people, you know, uh, one of the sort of ulterior motives that I had when I was writing the book is I wanted to write a book that would be about the Middle East um, and that people could read it and, and they would say, hey, that seems like a nice place. Or that seems like a really interesting place um, because so many books and so much of what we read about the Middle East is so sort of either exotified or is about conflict. Um, and I wanted to write something that was sort of separate from that. Um, and so that's part of it. That was I, your original mission. Yeah, that was my original mission. And yeah, yeah so I, I'd like to think that I, I've done the Rotary Foundation well. <laughs> um, the, um, but uh, I also, you know, it was interesting. I, I wrote the book sort of not thinking about how it fit into, you know, the literary landscape or anything like that, because when you're writing your first novel, it's a little bit presumptuous to think about that. Um, but after it was published, I sort of realized how, how strange of a novel it is compared to a lot of other sort of American novels, and especially a lot of American first novels, um, because people are often writing about sort of their childhood or their experience growing up or what have you, and, and this is obviously very far apart from that. Um, I think that, you know, when I think about who I look to, especially for this book, for guidance, um, and who my sort of artistic lineage is, it's all these really old European men. Mm. It's like Gunter Grass and Italo Calvino and Jose Saramago and um, a little W.G. Sebald. Um, and not that many Americans. Uh, my, my new book is, is, is a little bit, I think, fits in with that more, but it, I don't know, it was, it, it was interesting to sort of write a book that was exactly what I wanted and then sort of see how it fits in. And, didn't you also, uh, I think at one point, mention Roald Dahl and, uh, and Lewis Carroll and especially Alice in Wonderland? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I guess they're old European men too. Yes, they're European <laughs> men. Uh, from a different, different part of, uh, of the continent. Um, we're going to um, take some questions from you. In fact, a bunch of them are already here, so I'll, just, I'll go to some of your questions. And I guess Elaine explained uh, that you can just write them on a card and we'll, we'll go to them. Um, first question here is, um, this is the person who wanted to know, is there a sequel in the works? We've already answered that, but why did you decide to make the protagonist Jewish? You know, it, it, that's like the second most common question that I get. And, and so it's good that it was asked. I, it was never a decision for me. It was, you know, her being Jewish and her being female um, was always just sort of how it was. And I don't, I don't know where that came from. Um, but then the question became, how do I sort of present her Jewishness? What part does her Jewishness play in the novel? Um, and again, I wanted to walk a fine line. I wanted to sort of show the, the very real anti-Semitism that existed in the Ottoman Empire at that time, but also at the same time to sort of recognize that it's a you know, it's a multicultural society where Jews fled to mm -hmm. for hundreds of years, um, and Christians. And, and so, yeah, I thought there, there was sort of a tension there. And, I, I, you know, her being Jewish is not a huge part of the novel. It's, but, you know, what I say sometimes when people ask that is, is that, you know, for me being Jewish, is a big part of my life, but it's not a huge part of my life. It's not the, you know, it's not the identity on which my sort of plot turns all the time. Um, and yeah, so it's the same thing for Eleonora. On the big box of rugs in which she hid herself, was there a latch which a passerby might have closed? And the age of nine seems young to me. Should she have been age 11, perhaps? 
This is an editor already. Uh, Perhaps he should have. <laughs> well, I mean, considering how extraordinary her mind is and what a genius she is, um, a little bit of suspension of disbelief about a nine-year-old having that kind of uh, ability, although there are certainly prodigies and geniuses like that. Definitely. Sure. And I, um, yeah, I, so one of the reasons that I wanted her to be so young was so that she would be so exceptional. You know, a 13 or 14 year old who has her powers would be pretty amazing, but not, you know, magical. Um, the other reason that I thought it was important to have her be so young is that I didn't want any sort of um, sexuality to play into to the book. And I, I didn't want that to really be an issue when she was going to the Sultan. And if she was 11 or 12 or 13, it would start to be an issue with her, with the Sultan and with the Bey and with all these sort of men that are around her. But there's a way that being eight or nine allows you to have a certain innocence and to sort of bypass that, that issue. Were you using Ruhandra and the Satan's mother to set a contrast for nurturing styles? Interesting. Not consciously. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're, they're very different nurturing styles. And, you know, I think what's interesting about the two of them, if you're sort of comparing them, is, is they're very different ways of wielding power as a woman in that time. Um, and I think it's important to recognize the power that, and influence that women did have at that time, but also sort of how constrained they were. Um, and so Ruxandra and, and the Sultan's mother both exert enormous amounts of influence and power, have an um, enormous amount of power, but at the same time, they're, you know, they're sort of boxed in. Please speak about the role of the novel The Hourglass. Ah, so The Hourglass is a um, fictional novel that Eleonora is sort of like a touchstone for Eleonora. Um, and she looks to it to sort of understand the world. Um, and so for a long time, I, I was trying to find an actual novel for her to use. To, you had to, to make to one up, though. I had to make one up. I, you know, because I had like Jane Eyre, um, the fourth draft. And it would be every time I would want to find like, oh, you know, a, a little section about like being true to yourself. I'd have to look through all of Jane Eyre to, to find it, and then it wouldn't be there, I'd lose it. And, and so I, I found it was much more expedient to actually just write it. Um, so How that's many the, drafts were there, by the way? In, oh, there were seven. Seven, years. seven draft, one each year. Mm -hmm. That sounds biblical. You know? Yeah, it was kind of biblical. <laughs> so I think we're getting some more questions. The, yeah, but back to the hourglass. Uh, so oh, you just invented it. You know? Yeah, I just invented it. The, the, the less prosaic answer, is that um, I love the idea of, of a work of fiction or art that only exists inside of another work of fiction or art. Mm -hmm. um, so like in, in Proust, the, 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 the Vintuel Sonata, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, and so I was reading Proust a couple years ago, and it took such a long, it was really good, but it really takes a long time. And I, I kept finding myself wanting to listen to this thing that doesn't exist. Um, and even after I found out that it doesn't exist, I would still find myself being like, oh, I wish I could hear that. Um, but there's something about that type of work of art that is allowed to stay perfect. And it doesn't have to sort of exist in the messiness of reality. Um, and I love that. And, and so, I think a lot of people like the hourglass more than the Oracle of Stamboul. <laughs> but that's okay with me. You know, I feel like I wrote this amazing seven volume novel <laughs> and it exists inside people's heads um, and yet I only wrote like 500 words from it. So it's, it's kind of great. Well, you may, you know, Nabokov used to do that. He'd create a novel within a novel and then he'd write the novel. You know, mm -hmm. so, um, but you, you mentioned Proust. I, I'm struck by all of the sharp, awareness you bring into a reader of the senses and particularly of memory and how memory plays into the senses and so forth. I mean, and, and again, you're creating that to some extent out of whole cloth. I mean, you were in Turkey and all these exotic places, but you have to imagine what mm -hmm. they smelled like and what they tasted like and what was palpable in that particular time. 
Yeah, Bruce had it easy. Yeah. He lived the life. Right. He just, <laughs> we got somebody who wants to, actually, somebody who outlined the whole thing here said, could you please speak about the multiple parent-child relationships? And then Eleanor, her father, Eleanor and Bay, Eleanor and Mrs. D, uh, Mrs. D and her niece, Ian, her mother, Ian, her aunt, Sultan and his mother. I mean, somebody who really did a deconstruction yeah. kind of uh, diagrammatic <laughs> thing here. But was this pretty much uh, something you were tracking or that you had worked out? No, you know, not so much. I, I, I think that it's true, though, the parent-child relationships are sort of a fulcrum in, in the book, um, but in part because Eleonora has so many sort of parental figures. You know, she probably has like eight or nine different parental figures, and then all the other parent-child relationships, I think, are kind of foils for that relationship. Um, yeah, but I, I, I think that... It was not something I thought of consciously. It's something I thought of consciously about the next book, but, but not about this book. So maybe it's just something I'm interested in. Did you have to have her father die? Spoiler alert. <laughs> no, I think most of the people here have read the book. I'm just kidding. Um, I, you know what? I, I kind of think that I did have to have him die. I think that for her to fully mature, and to fully, you know, there's a sense at which, in which, you know, part of what makes the book interesting to me is the sense of danger. Um, menace. Menace, yeah, yeah that, that anything could happen to this child um, that we've gotten attached to. And with her father around, you know, he can protect her. He's not the best protector in the world, but he's still a pretty good protector. Um, and there's also, I think, there's a sense of loneliness that was really important to me in writing the book. Um, you know, she's sort of at the center of all this intrigue and speculation and projection, and yet she's like really profoundly lonely. Um, and I think that loneliness comes from her father dying. I mean, her mother dying, obviously, at the beginning, but then, but then her father dying sort of is the last nail in that coffin of loneliness. And it makes her an orphan, which is an archetypical figure, right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to have both of her ch parents die right at the beginning, because I felt like that'd be a little unrealistic. I just throw them off the cliff, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in many myths and fairy tales, it seems that the heroine often is motherless or even an orphan, almost as if she needs to be freed of a parent or parents in order to have her heroic adventures. What went into your decision to make Eleanor an orphan? I think you just answered that, didn't you? Um, any recommendation on a good readable history of the Ottoman Empire? Hmm. Gosh. Um, I th there's one called, I think it's called Osman's Dream, that's really good. Um, you know, there's not, a, and then there's, um, I'm totally blanking on his name right now, but The History of Modern Turkey. Um, but I, I don't want to re recommend him anyways, because I don't like Well, him. Will Durant's always good for just about any country. You know? Yeah. Um, why, are they, is it pronounced hoopoo birds? Hoopoo. And why purple? Can you speak a little louder? Why the hoopoo birds? And why purple? I'm sorry, I'm not using my broadcaster voice here. You can't hear <laughs> yeah. me. Sorry. Um, I think, you know, the hoop, I wanted to have birds following her around. I, I, I have to admit I stole that wholesale from Jose Saramago from his book, The Stone Raft. You were thinking augury, too, weren't you? Yeah, so it's, I feel like it was this wonderful way to, to show someone's magicalness yeah. without having, I mean, it is such a magical thing, and yet, if it was happening to someone in this world, you wouldn't think magic. You'd think, oh, some, something's wrong with like the magnetic field or something. Like, you know, it, it's possible, is what I mean to say. Um, and yeah, and so, so I wanted to have some birds following her around. I, I wasn't sure which, and then I came upon the hoopoo, which is just this amazing bird that has, you know, resonances and. Arabic and Persian and Hebrew literature. It's actually became the state bird of Israel like two years ago. Um, and so I just sort of fell in love with the symbolism and they're so strange looking. Um, and then the purple was, was, was just sort of, I wanted them to be extra special. And there's no such thing as a purple hoopoo. And you'd be surprised how many people in the world know that. Yeah, and a lot of them have come to my Some readings. Some of those emails. Yeah, you know. <laughs> the purple is always that color of the regal, right? Uh -huh. I mean, that's to the 
colorborn, they used to say, I mean, about uh, imperial people and so forth. Purple. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's appropriate. Please elaborate on the symbolism of the birds. Why do they disperse at the end? And what attracted you to use magical realism, fantasy, and myth? Mm. Why they disperse? I don't, I don't want to give like a real set answer for that, but I will say that I feel like they fulfilled their job. Um, but that's I like, that's good enough. Yeah. there's a lot of, you know, there was a lot of, I, I don't want to say too much because people have given me other explanations that I really love. Um, <laughs> Like one, one woman said that she felt like they were going off into the world to find where she was going to go next and to kind of prepare the ground for her for where she was going Isn't next. that great though when people interpret your work and they shine light on it and illuminate it in ways yeah, you hadn't even... Yeah, it's amazing. You know. I, I would never have thought that that... You, that so I would have thought that people would sort of misinterpret my work, but I would never have thought that people would come up with interpretations that I like more than my own. <laughs> How did One Book, One Marin discover you? I don't know. <laughs> um, I, 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 I suspect it has something to do with um, the folks at Book Passage, though, because they've been really wonderful. Elaine, so you want to come up and answer this? <laughs> <laughs> this? This little crew right down here, Karen and Calvin and Elaine. Well, uh, the whole committee uh, discussed a number of books. There were a number of books that were possible choices for 2012. Um, yes, it's true that Book Passage adores this book. The first time I read it, it was because it hadn't been published yet, and my colleague over there, Karen West, had read the pre-published version and told me that basically if I didn't read it that night, I was crazy. So I read it because I do what she says. Um, <laughs> but we had a big discussion about what the next book should be. And the committee just felt there was so much richness in this novel. We couldn't believe it was the first novel. It was, had so much depth, and we couldn't wait to talk about it to everybody in Marin. So that's kind of how it happened. It was a, a group of really tough people who made that decision. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for writing it. <laughs> uh, somebody wants to know about Pomek's books. Uh, did they influence you? Definitely. You mentioned them earlier. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I, when I was in um, Turkey having the Fulbright, I, I had not read any Pamuk, and so I figured, oh, God, i got to read Pamuk. Um, and I had like five or six of his books, um, and I just sort of tore through them, and it was at this really important sort of turning point in the book, um, and he really, really influenced. He, he's got this wonderful mix of sort of very um, intellectual, but also magical and um, and very homey um, style, and and it was actually very it was interesting. It was right after I finished the last of the books that I brought with me. He won the Nobel Prize, and um, and I was really like, yeah, I'm, I got ahead of the game. Um, but my students, I was teaching English at the time. Every single one of them hated him. Um, and it's, it's really phenomenal how unpopular Orhan Pamuk is in Turkey. I would go so far... A lot far, of it's political. Almost all of it's political, but then they sort of channel it into this aesthetic judgment. You know, uh, people will have like a political problem with him and then they'll say, oh, I tried to read the books and they're horrible. Um, I'd say he's probably, there might be someone else that I'm not thinking of, but of the like living Nobel Prize winners, he's probably the most unpopular in his own country. And, he lives in New York, because um, I, in part because I think he's scared of, of being killed. Yeah. I interviewed him, in fact, when he was living in New York, but he was visiting out here. What do you tell young people about, well, the whole odyssey of being a writer? I mean, you've had success now, but you had to slog through it. I mean, a fellowship here, a fellowship there, piecing things together financially mm -hmm. in order to sustain your habit of writing and mm -hmm. hope that it would work out with fruition like it has. But for most that's not the case. For most, in fact, uh, they don't even necessarily see a novel published. So what do you tell mm -hmm. young people? Well, I, I consider myself a young person still, but you know... <laughs> you work with children. Right? <laughs> I do work with children, true. Um, I think that the two most important things that I would say to people is, is to read. Because I think there's so many writers out there who don't read at all. Um, 
which is crazy to me. I, I can't even think of a metaphor to sort of describe how, how wild that is. Um, so that's the first thing, just read anything you can get your hands on, um, but preferably good stuff. Um, and second, to, to develop a, a practice of writing, because I think that there's a lot of writers who think of themselves as like these sort of 18th century romantic poets who, you know, will have like a bolt of lightning come down and they'll sort of write their brilliant work and, and, and then they can go back to their, you know, sort of doing whatever they do. Um, but I think that in order for whatever bolts come to come, you have to sort of be ready for that and be awake to that and you have to slog through. Um, and the old Mencken line is true. It's 1% uh, inspiration, 99% perspiration. I think, I think something like that, yeah. Or, or, you know, you get your inspiration and then you sort of have to spend 100 times as much time sort of hammering it out. Yeah. I was also thinking in asking that question, Flannery O'Connor used to say to creative writing students, too, too many people want to be novelists, too many people want to write novels, and there are too many bad novels. We don't need any more bad novels. I don't want to sound you know, cynical, but there are many kids, I see them all the time, who feel they want to be poets and writers mm -hmm. and so forth, many of whom don't read enough, of course, like you say. But the idea that it's sort of like, I want to be a baseball star or something. Yeah. I, want, I want to be a professional athlete or actor, isn't it? It is. I, I, you know, I, I, I love what Flannery, I love Flannery O'Connor. I love what she has to say about creative writing and creative writing teaching. And it, it's brilliant and witty and, and sharp. And, um, but I also think that that, you know, in some ways is sort of a self-serving argument. You know, I, I may think that now, but I certainly didn't think that three years ago um, at, when I was sort of counting myself in, in the other group. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I, I'd like to think that there is, even if everyone is not going to become a novelist who wants to, there's something wonderful about how many people do want to be writers. Um, because, you know, you sure make a heck of a lot money, more money being like a movie producer and you get a lot larger audience. Um, and so, but there still is some attraction of the written word. Um, and so I, I think it's great. I would just encourage that, even if those people turn out to be just great readers. Um, I think that that's a, that's a really wonderful sort of conclusion of that desire. Well, you're, you're a charming man. Uh, part of your charm is your self-effacing quality. Um, you're a gifted writer. You. Wish you continued success. A lot of people apparently want to see a sequel, but uh, congratulations on this book. <laughs> we'll wait for the next one.